part three. So, I would have said that not much could be worse, short of being dead or undead, than those first weeks after the night I went out to the lake and met some vampires up close and personal. I would have said that being paralyzed from the neck down or having an inoperable brain tumor would be worse. Not a lot else, just shows how limited the human imagination can be. The first weeks after Khan healed the wound on my breast were worse. It's funny because I had thought, living through those first two months after the nights at the lake, that the great crisis was about what I was, or who I'd become, or what terrible thing was wrong with me, and about to go wronger, and why all was changed as a result. But I was still struggling against the idea that all was changed. Sticking the giggler with the table knife should have shaken me out of this fantasy, even if the sucker sunshade trick hadn't. But I was too busy being grossed out by the sheer grisliness of the latter experience to have thought much about the philosophical implications. What the little chat with Jesse and Pat had revealed to me had done my head in worse, and the news that the suckers were on to conquer the world within the next century had been worse yet. I felt like a pancake in the hands of a maniac flipper, but when you're being caroomed around your life like a squash ball, you haven't got leeway to think about what happens next. When you're feeding the second coach load of tourists that day, you aren't thinking about the birthday party for 50 next week. Maybe you should be, but you aren't. Now is more than enough. Before the detox night with Khan, I still thought I could say no somehow, could still stick my head back in the sand. Hey, I wasn't going to be around in a hundred years, unless maybe I started handling a lot of magic, which I didn't want to, right? That was exactly what I didn't want to be doing. Magic handling extending your lifespan was a myth anyway, so what did I care? You can be a really nasty, selfish little jerk when you're scared enough. I was scared enough. Of course, I had had this apparently permanent leaking wound on my breast. I had had these nightmares, and I had been doing a pretty bad job, after all, of suppressing thinking about what it all meant what had happened at the lake, but I was still obstinately trying to pretend I'd only had a piece of very, very bad luck. And the fact of my ha having survived it wasn't irredeemable. My grand had shown me all that transmuting stuff 15 years ago, and I'd never used it before. Maybe it would be another 15 years before I used it again. Maybe 30 this time, and one vampire more or less. Who cares? And the table knife venture was just that the giggler had been the one who cut me, poisoned me. It was a one-off. There was an answer in there somewhere. It wasn't me. It wasn't my warped, screwed-up genetic heritage. And if I'd delivered the world of one sucker, sort of accidentally having preserved it another one, then my final effect on the vampire population was nil, invisible, void, which was exactly the profile I'd choose. I told myself I had always been my father's daughter. I was facing what had been there all the time. Being able to see in the dark sounds great. Never trip over the bathroom threshold on your way for a pee at midnight again, right? But it's not that simple. Human eyes don't see in the dark. They don't have the rods and cones for it or whatever. Therefore, you are doing something that isn't human. It's not like you've awakened a latent talent, like someone who finds out they have a gift for playing jazz piano after a life previously devoted to Bach. That may be odd, but it's within human scope. Seeing in the dark isn't, and you know it. That doesn't mean I know how to explain it, but trust me, you can tell the difference between seeing because there's enough light and seeing because something weird and vampire -y is going on in your brain that chooses to pretend to be happening in your eyes because that's the nearest equivalent. Like if some human had had a poisoned wound healed by some weird reciprocal swap with the phoenix, maybe they'd be able to fly afterward, apparently by flapping their arms. Mind you, no one has seen the phoenix in over a thousand years, and it has never been inclined to do humans any good terms. Rather the opposite, very like vampires, I suppose, except a lot of people think the phoenix is a myth, and not many are stupid enough to think vampires are. I 
think the phoenix has at least a 50-50 chance of being true because it's nasty. What this world doesn't have is the free wishes, go to the ball and meet your prince happily ever after kind of magic. We have all the mangling and malevolent kinds. Who invented this system? I saw in the dark pretty well, I thought. Do I want to see Bo coming? Oh yeah, and seeing in the dark doesn't mean when the sun goes down. It also means all the shadows that fall in daylight. This would not be a big issue for a vampire, of course, but it troubled the hell out of me. Even an ordinary table knife froze a shadow, although I didn't really need any more reminders that table knives would never be ordinary to me again. It throws your balance off seeing through shadows. Your depth perception goes wrong like trying to look through someone else's glasses. Everything has They might. He thinks of it on the move, and he says it on the move. He wondered a lot during the time the city council was trying to upgrade us. The media, who love a good story and truth is non-compulsory, presented Charlie's as the focus of the neighborhood campaign to stay the way we were, down market and crappy. This was not entirely false. That's when Charlie's kind of got on the new Arcadia map rather than merely the, the old town map. And one of the reasons was that Charlie could afford to build my bakery. I have to say he used to wonder a lot when Mom and I were at each other's throats the worst, too. There was some overlap between these two eras. Kenny and Billy are probably scarred for life. But having him wandering around again in that way I recognized made me feel bad. I didn't live with him anymore, but I had the impression he didn't wonder as much as he had been, that he'd mostly figured out how to say the sort of things he needed to say as Charlie of Charlie's. I suppose a magic handling baker with an affinity for vampires is kind of an unusual problem for a coffee house. Maybe the bitchiness factor was trivial. You've been having a little trouble lately, he said mildly and gently, addressing one of the ovens. That oven is working fine, I said, thinking, if you're going to, if you're going to me, you can just do it. He turned around, sorry, we, Charlie's, has had its rough times, but having SOFs interested in one of my staff is a new one. I refrained from pointing out that our regular SOFs had always sort of jived with me. I had thought because I was the one who wanted to hear their stories. But as it turned out, I now knew because they remembered my father, even if Charlie and for that matter, Mom and I didn't. Yeah, I said, it blows. I've been thinking, okay, my dad has always been my dad, but that doesn't help. I could have gone on not knowing what it meant. Charlie hesitated. Well, I doubt it, sunshine. If you just kept coffee hot, maybe, but someone who can. His voice faded. Have you talked to Sadie about it? I shook my head. Have I sawn myself in half with a blunt knife? No. You know what Sadie is like. No one better. You inherited her backbone, her doggedness. The big difference between my mom and me, besides the fact that she is dead normal and I'm a magic handling freak, is that she's the real thing. She may have a slight problem seeing other people's points of view, but she's honest about it. She's a brass-bound bitch because she believes she knows best. I'm a brass-bound bitch because I don't want anyone getting close enough to find out what a whiny little knot of naked nerve endings I really am. And her nasty temper, I said. Charlie smiled. She knew your dad pretty well. Do you know she loved him? She really did. Still does in her secret heart. 
Oh, she loves me, don't worry, and we're happy together. That's the point. She's happy running the admin side of Charlie's. And ripping self-important assholes to shreds, I thought, but get under cover if there hadn't been any self-important assholes around lately. She was often joyful, euphoric with your dad, especially at the beginning, but his wasn't a world she could live in. Mine is. My guess is she got out of your dad's world when she did and took you with her because she knew what you were. I think she knew you were going to be someone pretty unusual. I think she was hoping that what she's given you, both by being your mom and by raising you in a place like Charlie's, is going to be enough, enough ballast, when what your father gave you started coming out. I'd already figured out that she hadn't included him in the bad crosswatch, so what I was in Charlie's version of events didn't include the possibility of a demon taint. On the whole, I thought my version was more plausible than Charlie's, possibly because it was more depressing. I drifted in a very Charlie-like manner over to the stool and sat down. I looked at my hands, which had a funny red outlined light dark edge. I thought about bad jean crosses. I put my head in my hands and closed my eyes. What do you think, sunshine, said Charlie. Is it going to be enough? <clears throat> I don't know, I said. Charlie, I don't know. August was less death-defying than usual in terms of temperature, which among other things meant that I hadn't had to beg Polly not to quit, if not in terms of numbers of Earth Trek coach loads, and possibly because all the heat August hadn't used had to go somewhere. We went straight into Indian summer, September. Do not pass go. Do not collect 2,000 blinks. So I got out all my least decent little bit of nothing tank tops and wore them. The scar was visible, but the skin was flat and smooth, no puckering. And the white mark itself seemed weirdly old and sort of half-worn away looking, the way old scars get sometimes. I was still having trouble with the idea that what had happened that night counted as healing, but whatever it was, it had worked. I started going home with Mel a lot. He was glad to have me around, glad to stop arguing about my going to another doctor. He didn't know about Con, of course, but he knew plenty, too much, about recent events. He would know that I needed reassuring without knowing I needed to feel human. This is really stupid, but I also discovered that I somehow believed that he was the one human at Charlie's who might be able to stop me in time if my bad genes suddenly kicked in and I picked up my electric cherry pitter and went for the nearest warm body, that he'd drown me efficiently in a vat of pasta sauce while everyone else was standing around with their mouths open, wringing their hands and saying, who are we going to get to cover the bakery on such short notice? This was at its worst during Monday movie evenings. The set and living room had never seemed so small or so packed with flimsy, vulnerable human bodies. If Mel didn't feel like going, I didn't go either. As a romantic fantasy, I don't think it's going to make it into the top ten. Most women pining for the presence of their lovers aren't worried about needing their homicidal tendencies foiled, but it did mean I felt a little safer with Mel, Mel around. I probably didn't believe it at all. I just didn't want to give him up. He was warm and breathing and had a heartbeat. Human, yeah. I hadn't been willing to go see a specialist human doctor as Mel had kept asking me to. No, I asked a vampire for help and took it instantly when he offered it. Mel must have wondered what happened to the wound on my breast, but he didn't say anything. He was very good at not saying things. It had only been since the night of the table knife that I'd begun to, want to wonder if his reticence was for my sake or his. And if it was for his, no. I needed him to be steady, solid, secure. I needed it too badly to pursue that one, too badly to wonder about the number of live tattoos he had, even for a motorcycle thug. Another of the things I'd never thought about was the way when we went home together it was always his home. He'd been inside my apartment a handful of times. If we had an afternoon together, we went hiking or went back to his place. If we had an evening together and we decided to go out, we went where he wanted to go because there wasn't anywhere I wanted to go. I knew his friends. He didn't know mine. His house wards were set to know me. Mine weren't set to know him. I didn't have friends. I had the coffee house, a few librarians, chiefly Emile, who had been at Charlie's regular all her life, was as far afield as I went. 
It is halfway true that if you are involved in a family coffee house, you don't have a life, but only halfway. Mel had a life. I've said before that Mel had been a bit of a hoodlum in his younger days, although nobody seemed to be quite sure how much, or maybe his war service, had wiped earlier misdeeds off the record. He wasn't old now, but he'd had time to go wrong and then change his mind. There must have been signs he wasn't going wrong right, though, even at the time. Some of his tattoos were for pretty strange things. Some of them I didn't know the purpose of, because when I'd asked, he'd said, um, and gone silent. Anybody who spent a lot of time on or about motorcycles would have a couple of the regulation anti-crushed by flying metal or running into trees at high speeds wards either pricked into your skin or on a chain round your neck or a secret pocket in your belt or the soles of your biker boots. He had those. But he also had a seeing things clearly charm that I hadn't recognized when I saw it the first time. Okay, a useful thing for someone on the wrong side of the law or the wrong side of the battle zone who needs to have his eyes peeled for trouble. But Mel's wasn't the conventional block and warn ward that most petty crooks used for the purpose. You could sometimes half-identify the variety of Melfacent you were dealing with by whether or not you could see that ward. Scammers, of course, kept it well hidden, wouldn't do to have it dangling on a bracelet or tattooed on your wrist when you popped your cuffs at someone you were trying to snooze. A couple of Mel's old gang, who had also changed their minds about being professional bad guys, had it on the backs of their gonna-punch-you-in-the-nose hands. So the guy who was about to get punched would see it on the fist being held under his nose. Anyway, Mel still bought and sold motorcycles. He still drank beer with friends at the night house or the jug. Wives and steady girlfriends, very occasionally boyfriends, were expected to show up if they wanted to. Better yet, we were expected to talk. Of course, the women who could talk about ignition mi mixtures and piston resistance were preferred. But you can't have everything. He'd bought a house in what had been Chesterfield, but was now called Whiteout, the worst wars hit section of New Arcadia, had it clearly had it cleared and rewarded, and was slowly doing it over into something even my mother would recognize as habitable. Although the motorcycle refit garage on what had been the ground floor would probably have given her spasms. He loved cooking in Charlie's, but he wasn't owned by them. I felt like maybe I should be asking to borrow his survival textbook. Being away from home at 14 and lying about your age. And then being a biker bandit for a few years before deciding that the fact you always seem to wind up frying the sausages over the fire for everybody was maybe a pointer toward a different way of life with better retirement options, which five years of the wars had given him plenty of time to consider. Mel would have understood why I drove out to the lake that night. He probably did understand without my telling him. I would have liked hearing him understand, but I didn't want to tell him because I couldn't, couldn't tell him what happened after. But you don't have to talk when you're making love and bodies have their own language. Also, you don't have to use your eyes so much. There are other things going on. Meanwhile, I was still reaching the wrong distance to pick up the edges of baking sheets and muffin tins or the handles of spoons and fumbling them when I managed to grab them at all, and I walked into doors a little too often instead of through them. At least I knew the recipes I used all the time by heart and didn't have to bother peering at print mid-mix or identifying the lines on measuring jugs. Nor had I lost my sense of whether a batter or a dough was going together right or not or what to do if it wasn't. I could tell Jesse and Pat about seeing in the dark and let them tell me what to do about it or with it. As far as my strange new talents went, it beat hell out of unusual usages of table knives. And maybe if I told them, I could bear to tell the people at Charlie's. Nobody had to know anything about why I could now see in the dark, including the dark of the day. One day when Pat and John came in for hot out of the oven cinnamon rolls at about 6.32, I tipped them onto a plate myself and took them out while Liz was still yawning over the coffee pot. You have some free time soon, maybe, I said, trying to sound casual in my turn. They both shifted in their seats, trying not to point like hunting dogs. Not very many people, even at Charlie's, are at their best at that hour, but it doesn't pay to be careless. 
and Mrs. Bialski was there pretending to read a newspaper while waiting for one of her confederates to turn up to make a clandestine report. For you, sunshine, anything, said Pat. I'm off at two, I said. Come round the shop, said Pat. There are two desks in the entry, okay? You go up to the right-hand one and say Pat's expecting you and they'll let you straight in. I nodded. There was a young woman at that desk with a nameplate and a sharp uniform and a sharp look like she should have had a rank to go on the nameplate. But what do I know? She hit two buzzers, one that opened the inner door and one that presumably warned Pat because he came walking out to meet me before I'd gone very far down the faceless hallway Mel must have brought me out of the last night of the giggler's existence on this earth. But it was so characterless, I was ready to believe I had crossed one of those distance-folding thresholds and was now on Mars. If so, Pat was there with me. Maybe we'd been on Mars that night, too. What if the wrong person showed up first and said you were expecting them, I said. I told them middling, tall, skinny, weird-looking hair because it will have just been let out of being tied up in a scarf for working in a restaurant. And you never comb it wearing a fierce look, said Pat. I was pretty safe. Fierce, I said. I also thought skinny, but I have my pride. The part about my hair is true. Yeah, fierce, through here. And he opened a door and shepherded me through. This was presumably Pat's office. The chair behind the desk was empty, but had that pushed back, someone just got up look. Jesse was sitting on a chair to one side of the desk. Someone I want you to meet, Pat said, nodding toward the other person in the room, who stood up out of her chair and said in a, in a rather stricken voice, Hi, Emile. I looked at her and she looked at me. With my funny vision, the sockets of her deep eyes and the hollows of her cheeks had a glittering dark periphery. Okay, I said, planning not to lose my temper unless it was absolutely necessary. What are you doing here? T said Pat blandly. Tell me what Emil is doing here first, I said. Well, we're in putting all our cards on the table, Vogue, now, aren't we, said Pat, still bland, since the other night. So it's time you knew Emil is one of us. One of you, I said, SOF, and here I thought she was a librarian. Undercover, SOF, Jesse said. Part-time, added Pat. I am a librarian, said Emil, but I'm sometimes a, er, librarian for SOF, too. I thought about this. I'd known Emile since I was seven and she was nine. She and her family had had Sunday breakfast at Charlie's most weeks for years, were already regulars when Mom started working there, and then when I started hanging out there. She was one of the faces I recognized at my new school. I'd lost half a year being sick, and then Mom crammed the crap out of me the second half of the year so I didn't lose a grade when I went back to school in the fall. Yes, I mean cram. Second grade is freaking hard work when you're seven or eight. In hindsight, that was the beginning of Charlie's being my entire life. I didn't have time to make friends the six months I was being crammed. The only kids I met were kids who came to Charlie's. Not that I got to know many of them because I wasn't allowed to annoy the customers. But Emil used to ask for me, so I was allowed to talk to her. She talked to me because she felt sorry for me. I was weedy and undersized and hangdog that half year and always doing homework. I forgot how it started. Maybe she saw me sitting at the counter studying, which I was allowed to do when it wasn't too crowded. We'd managed to stay friends outside of school, although not inside so much. Two years is the Grand Canyon when you're a kid. She'd gone off to library school my junior year and did an internship at the big downtown library the year after I started working full time at Charlie's and we used to get together to complain about how hard working for a living was. Two years later, she got a job at the branch library near Charlie's. Sometimes she still had Sunday morning breakfast at Charlie's with her parents. When did you become SOF, undercover, part-time, or hanging upside down on a trapeze, I said. I did not sound friendly. I did not feel friendly. Twenty months ago, she said quickly. I relaxed slightly. Okay, so why did you? Emile sighed. It seemed like a good idea at the time. She glanced at Pat and Jesse. I glanced at Pat and Jesse, too. If they looked any more bland and non-confrontational, they were going to dissolve into little puddles of flop. Emile looked back at me. You're not going to like this, she said. I know, I said. SOF monitors GlobeNet usage for who likes to read up a lot on the others, said Emile. That's how they found me. 
They have a note of everybody who subscribes to the dark line, which included both her and me. In theory, any heavy-duty line into the cause world will let you look up anything you like on the globe net, and the perimeters are drawn only by your subscription price and the weight of the line. But in practice, it is a little more specific than that. The dark line is what you are going to choose if what you are chiefly interested in is looking up all the latest the globe net could give you on the others without going to dark shop or the library or some other public place or some other public hook in for it. If I'd ever given a passing real world thought to anything outside my bakery, I would have known SOF must do stuff like monitor the dark line, which would mean they would know I used it, that with my dad was easily enough to interest them in me. If I'd ever given a passing real world thought to it, which I hadn't, I'd lived in my own swaddled up little world. I, who had been the star pupil in June Yanofsky's vampire lit class, but what was the point, really? The others were still something that happened between the covers of books like Vampire Tales and other eerie matters. SOF Shop Talk, overheard at Charlie's, was just live stories. Dry guys happened, but never to anybody I knew. Vampires were out there, but nowhere near me, until recently. We'd already found you, of course, Pat said to me, because of your dad. Yes, I said. You could stop reminding me. Nothing wrong with your dad, is there, I said to Emile. Emile laughed a little bitterly and bowed her head. As her bangs fell across her forehead, they left flickering mahogany bars against her skin. I blinked. Nothing that I know of, or with my mom either. That's why it came as such a shock to them when I had two sets of adult teeth come in. a dentist, a discreet dentist, and scared to death there might be something wrong with his blood. Also, fortunately, my second set wasn't the kind that keeps growing, although they were a funny shape. Once they were out, they've stayed out, and my mom's cousin doesn't have anything to do with our branch of the family anymore. But I'm not registered. Remember Azar? I was already remembering Azar. He'd been the year between Emil and me. My freshman year in high school, he was the only sophomore on the varsity football team. That was before his lower jaw began to drop and widen to hold the spectacular pair of tusks that started to grow at the same time. They took the tusk out, of course, but they couldn't do much reconstructive surgery on his face till his jaw stopped expanding. After the first surgery, his family left town so that he could start school again somewhere they hadn't known him before. That was after he'd been registered, after our school had taken away all his sports awards because he was a part blood, and must have had, ipso facto, an unfair advantage, which is crap, and he'd been a nice guy. He wasn't stupid or a bully. It's an interesting situation, Pat interrupted, because one of SOF's official purposes is to find unregistered part bloods, register them and find their asses good, if not arrest them and throw them in jail, which happens sometimes too. One of SOF's unofficial purposes is to find certain kinds of unregistered part bloods, protect them from getting found out, and persuade them to work for us. We really like librarians. They tend to have tidy minds. Librarian part bloods are probably flash easy to find, said Emil. We'll be the ones who belong to other watch and beware. These are the two biggest globe net trawlers for other foe, exclusive to the dark line. For a modest extra monthly fee, you too can download 11 gigabytes gigabytes every week and experience mental overkill paralysis unless you are a trained member of SOF or a research librarian or a prune-faced academic and have a cyborg overdrive button for taking in foe. I didn't have the overdrive button. Besides, I'd always had a guilty preference for fiction. Since I seemed now to be living fiction, this proved to have been an entirely reasonable choice. I spend a few hours every week reading certain threads and, well, following my nose. We contacted her because the filters she'd set up herself on her subscription password seemed to bring her a peculiarly high level of source traffic by others in part bloods, not just about them. So we had her in for a few chats, and once she softened up a little. Did someone turn blue for you too, I said. Emil smiled. Yeah. We found out that that nose of hers often told her when your actual other had actual fingers on the keyboard, and that had sometimes been very interesting, and that has sometimes been very interesting, said Jesse. 
Especially when she picks up a sucker, said Pat. They all saw me freeze. Hey, kiddo, said Pat. That's kind of the point, you know, nailing vampires, remember? I nodded stiffly. The rift, or did I mean rifts in my life, were getting deeper and wider all the time. I only just stopped myself from reaching up to touch the thin white scar on my breast. If any of these people had noticed that I'd spent the entire sweltering summer wearing high-necked shirts, they hadn't mentioned it, and they weren't mentioning that I had suddenly stopped wearing them for a mere autumn burst of pleasantly warm weather either. I, I just don't like talking about vampires, I said after a moment. If one-fifth of the world's wealth, or possibly more, lay in vampire hands, of course there were a lot of them out there with not just basic comm gear to handle their bloated bank balances, but monster comm networks that meant they had probably stopped noticing they weren't able to go outdoors in daylight. Plenty of human comm techies never went out in daylight either, but comm networks would include trog lines into the globe net, and some vampires who had them no doubt amused themselves chatting up humans. I knew this, but those vampires were scary, faceless, boogie people that SOF existed to deal with. What was I doing here in an SOF office? Part blood sticking together, I suppose. What if I told them that I didn't know I was one of the lucid 10%? I shivered. Did Bo have a line into the globe net? He was a master vampire. Of course he did. Did Khan? I shivered again, harder. Sunshine, I'm sorry, Emil said. I know it doesn't mean much, but sometimes when I'm tracking some, something, even that much contact, through however many miles of trog and ether, it starts to make me sick. I can't imagine what it must be like for you. True. Now about that tea, said Pat. You still haven't told me why you're here, like today, now, this minute, in Pat's office, I said to Emil. She shook her head. Serendipity, I guess. I showed up this afternoon to plug in my usual report, and Pat brought me in here. Said I was about to meet an old friend who was also a new recruit, and maybe I could reassure her that having anything to do with SOF doesn't automatically mean you're going to lose your interest in reading fiction and will wake up some morning soon with an overwhelming urge to wear khaki and start a firearm collection. Pat, who was wearing navy blue trousers and a white shirt, said, hey. Navy, blue, and white are khaki, too, said Emil firmly. But, Ray, I didn't know it was you until you walked through the door. Then why are you saying you're sorry about what happened to me? What do you know about it? Emil stared at me, visibly puzzled. What happened? Since the, the other night, all of Old Town knows you were in some kind of trouble with suckers. Those two days you went missing last spring, and a lot of us were already wondering, what else could it have been? Right, what else could it have been? It could have been a rogue demon, I said obstinately. Emil sighed. Not very likely. A lot of part bloods can spot other part bloods, right? I haven't got Pat's gift for that, but a full blood demon. If you'd been held by rogues, I'd have known it, like cat hair on your shirt. So would whoever from SOF interviewed you You have known it. SOF wouldn't have assigned someone to interview you who wouldn't have known it. And Jocasta's good, said Pat, even better than me. Good wasn't the adjective I'd have chosen for my experience of that interview, but I let it pass. So would a lot of other people who come into Charlie's have known it, Emil continued? Haven't you noticed, well, like that Mrs. Bialski hardly lets you out of her sight these days? Mrs. Bialski is aware, I said. Yeah, and her sense of smell is real good, said Pat. She's another undercover SOF, I suppose, I said. Pat laughed. SOF couldn't hold her, he said. She and Yolandi should get together, I thought, but I didn't say it out loud. If, if SOF had no reason to look into my landlady, I wasn't going to suggest it to them. If Pat thought she was a Siddhartha, all the better. And if they already had looked, I didn't want to know. Jesse said gently, You know there's such a thing as friends as well as colleagues and neighbors, don't you? I had my mouth open to say, Sure, and you've been hanging around Charlie's watching me with at least four eyes a day, if I'd just been some poor mug that got mixed up in something ickly other, right? And then I closed it again, because I realized that the answer was yes. They might not have been watching me so intensely, and they might not have been watching me in the hopes that whatever had happened might lead them to something they could use without reference to a continuing and uninterrupted supply of cinnamon rolls. But they would have been watching me, because that was what SOF was for. In theory, the first and most important thing it was for, to keep our citizens safe. 
An SOF for all its faults took that pretty seriously. I sighed. So how about that cup of tea? And then maybe you'll finally tell me why you wanted me to meet Emil here. Pat spun his comm box around so the screen faced Emil. She sat down and tapped herself in, and the screen cleared to the globe nut symbol. I averted my eyes. Since I'd started seeing in the dark, I couldn't look at any comm screen for long. TV, net, personal, game deluxe, not my territory, but Kenny had an amazing one. Whatever, brr. Vertigo wasn't in it, although migraine came close. At least I wasn't wasting subscription fees on other watch and beware by my not having gone near my comm box lately. I could tell, however, watching out of my peripheral vision that Emil was calling up lists of mail saves. She chose a list, hit a button, and mail text blocks appeared. I felt an almost physical jolt and reached out to steady myself on the back of her chair. Ah, said Pat, watching me. What? I said nastily. I don't like surprises, especially this kind of surprise, and this was my second since I came through the front door of SOF HQ. Emil said, studying the screen, I save anything that, well, that I guess comes from another, right? That feels funny. That's what these guys pay me for. There are a lot of us doing it. We don't know who each other are, of course, but I doubt we're all librarians. And when some net tag is making a lot of us jumpy, SOF tries to find out more about who's or what's behind it. Jesse asked me to separate off some tags that are on SOF's active list that I personally think feel like vampires rather than something else, and we wondered if any of them might mean something to you, you know, locationally, said Jesse. Locationally, I thought irre irrelevantly, is this the same English I speak? After what happened the other night, said Jesse, the way you knew where it was even though it was too far away for you to err here in, in the usual way, or see, what made you jump when Emil opened her mail save list? I shook my head. Presumably I'm reacting to what you want me to be reacting to, yes, I said. But whether it's going to be anything but a sensation like putting your fingers in an electric socket, I don't know. Try it, said Jesse. Emil stood up from the chair and I sat down, trying to examine myself for signs that my evil gene was waking up. This would be a logical moment for it, I felt, and probably quite a practical one, too, from the perspective of lingering final moments of philanthropic, philanthropic sanity. Jesse and Pat would be trained in hand-to-hand, -hand, and even a mock, and four as hell with the muscles you get if you bash the blob into trays of cinnamon rolls every morning. I should be a pushover for a couple of veteran SOF field agents. The screen glowed at me balefully. I shut my eyes. Nothing was happening. My body went on breathing quietly, waiting for me to ask it to do something. What do I do? If you hit next, Emil said, you go to the next message. I opened my eyes long enough to find the next button. I could look at the keyboard. I glanced at the screen. The words there wiggled. I didn't like it, but it didn't say vampire to me either. I hit next. More wiggly words, ugh, nothing else though. I hit next, and then next, next. There was an odd building up of internal pressure that I couldn't quite put down either to trying to look while not looking at a comm screen that was longing to give me a lightning bolt, thunder roll, Odin bloody headache, or to the knowledge that I was surrounded by SOFs avidly waiting for me to do something, or that I was waiting to pop into Incredible Hulk mode and try to eat somebody, so I could guess that my shady rapport, affinity, global navigational pinpoint precision positioning device, patent pending or whatever, was acknowledging the presence of vampires somewhere out there behind the screen, but so? Next, next, next. I was sweating. I realized what the pressure was. Expectation. I was getting close. Close to what? Next. Here. I snapped my eyes closed and flung myself back in the chair, which rolled several feet away from the desk till it hit the corner of a table pushed against the wall. An unhandily stacked heap of paper spilled off onto the floor with a swoosh. I got up shakily, keeping my eyes averted from the screen. I could feel the beating of the hear. I turned my head back and forth as if I was standing in a field looking for a landmark. No, not there. I moved round a quarter turn and waited to reorient the hear. No, I moved another quarter turn, almost, 
an ape turn back. No, an ape turn forward, then another ape. Yes, here. I raised an arm that way. Now turn whatever it is off because it's making me sick. Emil dived for it and the screen went blank. I sat down. Well, 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 said Pat. The satisfaction in his voice made me suddenly very angry, but I felt too tired and sick to tell him so. I closed my eyes. I opened them again a minute later. Steam from a cup of hot tea was caressing my face. I accepted the cup. Caffeine was my friend. I wasn't sure if I had any other friends in that room or not. The special other forces exist to control, defeat, neutralize, or exterminate all other threat to humans. That was easy and straightforward, and as a human, it sounded, had sounded pretty good to me. Although at the same time, I'd had a problem with the politics of anything other than as bad, which seemed to be the unofficial SOF motto. Now I was learning that in fact SOF was apparently full of part bloods, maybe full bloods, and presumably wares, and was clandestinely sympathetic to the registry dodgers. It should have cheered me up. If I was a part blood myself, I was a part blood among part bloods. I should be eager to cooperate with my own little group of SOFs. Who hated vampires, all vampires, by definition. Who hated and targeted vampires because they believed that vampires were not merely making everybody's lives more dangerous, but their own lives harder. Their lives as good, socially well-adjusted and well-disposed part demons or demons as wares who only needed a night off once a month. If it wasn't for vampires, so Pat's theory went, the humans would probably repeal the laws that automatically prevented anyone with other blood from enjoying full human rights. The theory was probably right. Not to mention the less than a hundred years before we all go under the dark thing. It wasn't only that seeing in the dark creeped me out because it came from a vampire, it was that it made me permanently, relentlessly, continuously conscious of being connected to vampireness. I do not know what I have given you tonight. I do not know what you have given me. I was aware of it standing motionless outdoors at noon on a sunny day. Even the absence of shadow is a kind of shadow. You may not know that, but I do. I did now. I wondered if this was anything like the, dare I say, usual realization of part-bloodedness. Knowing that you are and are not human, but angrily, frustratedly believing that this didn't make you any less of a, a what exactly, a human, a person, an individual, a rational creature, remind me that you are a rational creature. I wished I could ask somebody, but nobody was part vampire. It wasn't possible. Whatever I was, that wasn't it. Was it? Was it? Drink your tea, sunshine, and stop thinking. Thinking is not your strong suit. There was something else that was bothering me about all this, but I couldn't get that far yet. I didn't have to. Where I was was far enough to feel no mad about. Feeling better, said Pat. No, I said. Do you know what you were pointing at? No, I said. I looked up along the line I had indicated and thought about which way the SOF building lay and where I thought I was in it. I'd probably been pointing west, something like west. That wasn't a big help. West was where all the deserted factories were, where the worst of the urban bad spots were. Nobody lived out that way now as the population slowly began to recover from the voodoo wars. Rather than trying to reclaim any of that area, new malls and office blocks and housing developments were going up in the south and east and also avoiding the lake and its bad spots, curling around eventually, avoiding druggy nirvana up to the north. The reason anybody was trying to salvage Chesterfield was because it was south. In 20 or 30 years, we in the next town to the south... Pascatoa would probably be one big city, unless we all went under the dark early. The western end of New Arcadia isn't entirely deserted. It has some rather murky small businesses scattered around, and some clubs the police keep closing down that open again a day or a week later. Sometimes they reopen briefly somewhere else. Sometimes they don't bother to pretend to move. It is the western end of town where gangs of mostly human, mostly teenage boys go to play chicken and look for vampires. 
It is also a popular area for squatters, although the attrition by death rate is pretty severe. A lot of the murky small businesses that manage to hold on there cater to squatters who can't afford to pay for housing, but if they want to stay alive, have to pay for some warning. There are two kinds of cheap wards, the ones that don't work and the ones that mess with what, for want of a better phrase, I'm going to call black magic, which gives you the idea. The homeless are better off sleeping in the gutters in Old Town, but I admit that for Old Town's sake, it's a good thing most of them don't. It didn't take a combox or a kick in the head to tell anyone in New Arcadia that if they were looking for suckers to look west. I was pointing west, I said grudgingly. Big deal. We don't know if it's a big deal yet or not, said Pat reasonably. We won't know till we drive you out there. No, I said. It might be, for example, Pat continued unfazed, that it isn't the west of New Arcadia at all. It could be somewhere a lot further away. Springfield, Lucknow, Manchester. Manchester had a rep as a vampire city. The globe net is the globe net. You never know where a specific piece of Cosmel has come from. Unless you're SOF and you track it down, I said. There was a little silence. Jesse sighed. It's not that easy. I mean, tracing something off the net is never easy. There are all those boring laws about privacy, I said, which even SOF has to make an effort to break, said Pat. But a lot of the usual rules of um, physics don't work quite the same with others as with humans. Jesse continued. Yeah, I thought. How does a 180-pound man turn into a 90-pound wolf? Where does the leftover 90 go? Does he park it in the umbrella stand overnight? Geography and vampires is one of the worst. Where they are and where we are often doesn't seem to uh, relate. <clears throat> Vampire senses are different from human in a number of ways. It is not the distance that is crucial, but the uniformity. Evidently, this worked in, um, in, in both um, directions. Einstein was wrong. I wondered if it was too late to give my skeggy old physics teacher a bad day. So even if we got a good read off a of Cosmel that we were sure was lobbed by a sucker, we still might not know any more than we did before we wasted some of SOF's tax blinks cracking it. We can use all the help we can get. Which I think I said to you already not long ago, added Pat. You might also keep in mind that the guys who don't want to be found usually have the edge on us guys who want to find them. Even the human ones, and they're usually easier. Sunshine, give us a break. We're not trying to ruin your life for fun, you know. I stared into the bottom of my mug. Not Jesse or Pat's fault that I was bound to a vampire. I didn't think they'd be real open to the idea of making an exception for him. I wasn't happy about it myself, but I could hardly tell Pat that the reason SOF was so full of covert part bloods now made me feel worse, not better. I was getting to a pretty bad place if I was beginning to wonder if maybe going bonkers and having to be bagged for my own good might be my best choice. What if what I had pointed toward was Khan? No, the answer came almost at once, no. What I had pointed toward was something, something in itself sick-making, antithetical to humans, to anything warm and breathing. Betrayal would be a different sort of sick, I was sure. I was pretty sure. A human shouldn't be able to think in terms of betraying a vampire. It didn't work. Like those nonsense sentences they used to wake you up when you were supposed to be learning a foreign language. I eat the hat of my uncle. I sit upon the cat of my aunt. Depends on the cat, of course. It didn't work like being able to see in the dark didn't work. The bottom of my mug was in
over to the sun the gray window of Pat's office. The sunlight felt thin, but it was sunlight. SOF windows were all gray because of the proof glass. Proof against bullets, firebombs, fire bombs, kamikaze wares, glass and steel cutting demon talons, spells, charms, almost everything but an armored division with howitzers. Proof glass had only come on the market about 10 years ago, just after the wars, which might have been a little less fatal if it had been inv invented a few years earlier. All high-risk businesses and the military and most other government departments, plus a lot of paranoids, both the kind with real enemies and the other kind, now had proof glass in their windows and their vehicles. Proof glass upgrader was a popular new career among young magic handlers. You didn't have to be a magic handler to get hired as an upgrader, but you'd probably live longer. Nobody had figured out how to make it less gray, though. Gray and depressing, like being in jail. Hadn't they done studies that humans really need sunlight, not just light, sunlight? And all humans, not just me. I hoped Charlie's wasn't going to have to put in proof glass. I hoped I was still human. Pat drove and put me in the front seat with him. Can you still feel whatever? I thought about it, reluctantly. I poked around for that feeling of here. I found it. It was like finding a dead rat in your living room, a large dead rat. Yes, I said. buildings quickly became Old Town, which turned almost as quickly into Downtown, and then rather more slowly into nothing in particular town. Blocks of slightly shabby houses giving way to blocks of somewhat seedy shops and offices and back again. It wasn't a big city. We went over the line into what most of us called No Town far too soon. In the first place, I didn't want to go there at all. In the second place, I didn't like being reminded that it was so close. New Arcadia's only big bad spots are in No Town, which did compel a certain amount of evasive driving. Even an SOF car can only go where there are still roads, and urban bad spots get blocked off fast, but we weren't going nearly indirectly enough for me. Here moved out of the back of my mind into the front, like large zombie rat getting up off your living room floor and following you into the kitchen where you realize that it's bigger and uglier than you thought, and it's tea for longer, and while zombies are really, really stupid, they're also really, really vicious. They're also nearly as fast as vampires, and since they don't just happen, they're made for a purpose. If one is coming after you, that's probably its purpose, and you're in big trouble. Here was getting worse. It was going to burst out of my skull and dance on the dashboard, and it wouldn't be anything anyone wanted to watch. Stop, I said. Pat stopped. I tried to breathe. Zombie rats seemed to be sitting on my chest, so I couldn't. I couldn't see it anymore, though. There didn't seem to be anything left but its little red eyes. No, its huge, drowning, no-color eyes. I can't anymore turn around, I think is what I said. I don't remember. I remember after Pat turned around and started driving back toward Old Town. After what felt like a long time, I began breathing again. I was clammy with sweat and my head ached as if pieces of my skull had been broken and the edges were grinding together, but Zombie Rat was gone. That had been far too much like the bad spot the SOF car hadn't protected us from, the day Jesse and Pat took me back out to the house on the lake. Those no-color eyes, both mirror flat and chasm deep, if they were eyes. But we hadn't tried to drive through a bad spot, and this time it was just me. Pat and Jesse hadn't noticed anything, except my little crisis. I didn't know if I was angry or if they were making me try to do whatever, or at the fact that I'd failed. I'd been to no town when I was a teenager. It wasn't like I had no idea. Any teenager with the slightest pretensions toward being stark, spartan, whatever, which I'm afraid I had had, We'll probably give it a try if it's offered, and it will be offered, and no town is a rite of passage. Quite sensible kids go at least once. I've been there more than once. Some of the clubs were pretty Spartan by anyone's standards. Kenny said, out of mom's hearing, this was still true. And it was also still true, Kenny said, that you dared each other to climb further in, over the rubble around the bad spots, although nobody got very far. But I hadn't got any far less than anyone else when I was his age. So had whatever it was moved there since my time, or was I just more sensitive now that I had been than I had been? No town was actually a lot cleaner now than it had been when I was 16 and 17, which was right after the wars. 
Having been once captured by vampires, did I now overreact to their presence? If overreact to vampires wasn't a contradiction in terms. Or was this another horrible specific one-off, like my having heard the giggler when no one else could? I didn't know if I wanted the answer to be yes or no. If it was no, then it might mean my sucker connection was general, which didn't bear thinking about. But if it was yes, then it meant I was picking up something to do with Bo, which didn't bear thinking about. Unless it was Khan, unless this had been his daylight wards protecting him, protecting us in the company of a couple of sucker-hating SOFs. No, it wasn't Khan. Whatever it was, it wasn't Khan. Pat drove around in the SOF back lot again. Neither of them had said any word of blame or failure or frustration to me, although I felt I could hear them both thinking, words like triangulation. I didn't know if they'd marked where I made them turn around, probably, but neither of them mentioned it yet. I'd take you straight to Charlie's, but I don't think you want the neighborhood seeing you show up in an SOF car, Pat said, as offhand as if we'd been buying groceries. I started to shake my head. Unmarked SOF cars were like SOFs out of uniform. You still knew, but changed my mind. Thanks. I fumbled for the door handle. Do you want to come back in? You look a little worn. There are a few bedrooms in the back. They're pretty basic, but they have beds. This time I did manage to shake my head carefully. No, thanks. I'm going for a walk. Clear my head. The last thing I wanted to do was lie down in a small dark room and try to go to sleep. I didn't want to go home either. There might be a dead rat in the living room. I got out of the car, lifted my face to the sunlight. It felt like a good fairy's kiss, except good fairies don't exist. 